My name is William Lee Bowers, Jr. I was born in Palestine, Texas on October 7th, 1929. All right, and what were your mother and father's names? My father's name was William Lee Bowers, Sr. My mother's name was Ellen Hughes Bowers. What hospital were you born in? I was born in the International Great Northern Railroad Hospital in Palestine, Texas. How old were your parents when they had you? Oh, let's see. I was born in 29. My father would have been 29. My mother would have been 27. And what about siblings? Well, I was the firstborn in my parents' family. I had one brother, Peter Andrew Bowers, who was born three years after I was. His birthday, <coughs> excuse me, was in November, uh, November 18th. Okay. And where was your first home when you were a child? Well, it was in Palestine, Texas. And it was what's now known as the Bowers Mansion and it had been purchased by my grandfather in the 1870s and added on to, and it had a, it was a large two-story uh, home, uh, and it had on the premises, it had what we used to call the cistern, which was the original water system for the house that collected rainwater that was used for household purposes. And then it had a large barn that had a two-car garage, and in addition to having the two-car garage, uh, had a uh, uh, upstairs sort of loft area, and then on the outside it had stalls where livestock, horses, cows, had been kept, and it had a small outbuilding that we called a chicken house where the chickens stayed at night, and then we had another structure on it that consisted of a greenhouse with a woodshed backing up to that and then a two-story servants quarters. And the outbuildings are still actually intact and we understand that it has been turned into a bed and breakfast now. All right, tell me about your grandparents. Well, there's kind of some background that everyone ought to know. There are essentially between my family and my wife's family, there are several key families that had some pretty interesting people in them. And on your mother's side of the family, there were the, uh, of course, the Murphy family and the Hayden family and the Evans family. And uh, on my side, there was the Numpson family, the Bowers family, and the Hughes family, and the O'Connell family. And on my grandparents, my maternal grandmother, whom I knew, I never knew either of my grandfathers because they predeceased me, but the two grandmothers that I knew were my paternal grandmother, uh, Nellie O'Connell Bowers, and my maternal uh, uh, grandmother, uh, Lillian uh, Numpson Hughes. The Numpsons originated when my great-great-great-grandfather left Germany to avoid being conscripted into Bismarck's army. This is kind of a tradition that I was told by my grandparents. And they settled in Baltimore and then parts of the family worked their way west. And my grandmother was married first to a gentleman by the name of Jared, who was apparently something of a scholar. He had a large collection of books that uh, 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 had his name inscribed in them that were in the library in my grandmother's home. And then he passed away and she married uh, a gentleman, Peter Hayes Hughes. His family came from Northern Ireland. They were Presbyterians. And 
I don't know much about his family except that he had some brothers who were sea captains of whom he was frightened for some reason. Uh, he worked his way to Texas and among other things he was caught in the 1900 storm in Galveston and saw the horrors of that event. Uh, he and my maternal grandmother were married and they had two children. The oldest uh, George Numpson Hughes and the other one was my mother Ellen Hughes Bowers. Uh, she had her name stuck in there someplace Berkeley uh, and uh, uh, they were both born to fairly prominent business people in Palestine and my grandfather on my father's side had worked for different railroads. His story is that uh, he and his brothers and sisters and parents lived on a farm in South Carolina. Yellow fever ep epidemic wiped out the parents and all of the children except for my grandfather and one brother, Jacob, that he had. And he and Jacob were nursed to health by a slave that they owned. This was before the Civil War. And later, uh, about the end of the Civil War, he had recovered. Uh, they had this deeply indebted farm. And they could have sold the slave and probably kept the farm, but they freed the slave. And my grandfather, who was about 13 or 14 at the time, with a fourth grade education, went to work for whatever railroad was being constructed in that area. And his first job was carrying water to the workmen. And he learned basically railroad construction. His older brother Jacob had had some education, probably equivalent to about a high school education now, and uh, later became an engineer. Uh, my grandfather, his full name was Andrew Lawrence Bowers, and he worked his way around the country learning railroad construction. And in about the 1870s, 1880s, he became the superintendent of the construction of the International and Great Northern Railroad in Palestine. Let's skip to another family. Uh, your mother's grandfather also worked for the railroads initially. He was what you would call a locomotive engineer or locomotive mechanic. In other words, if the ro locomotives or cars broke down, he was supposed to know how to fix them and he worked all over the United States and for a time lived and worked in Palestine for the IGN. I met uh, John Murphy, the grandfather, when uh, Lee and I were going together in college and he was visiting his son Frank Murphy and I got to sit down and visit with him and he told me that he had in fact uh, lived and worked in Palestine for a while and he knew my grandfather who was known as Barney. He was a great big, in, in his latter years he was, he was extremely heavy uh, and that he had also had met my maternal grandmother at a dance. And that is about all I remember of the conversation. So anyway, my, um, my uh, parents married uh, in 1926. And my father had been born in 1900. My mother had been born in 1902. And so I was born in 29, in October, the same month that the Great Depression started. And we lived in Palestine and my father had taken over the family business. His father had died in 1926 and my 
paternal grandmother had had some heart difficulties, as had had my maternal grandmother. Ready? Well, when my paternal grandmother had her health problems, my parents moved into the old family home. And I've briefly described it before, but it was a large white house. And you would come in the front gate and it had a fence around the front yard, uh, of sort of a wire fence and then a, a nine foot wooden fence around the back part of it. And you'd come in the front door and there was this tile floored vestibule and <coughs> you'd go into sort of an entry hall and the stairs were on the right. And then there was a sort of, I don't know what you might call in those days a parlor. In other words, if you had some really nice people visiting you, that's where you sat and talked. And then behind that was what we used to call the living room. And next to that was the dining room. And then behind that, behind the door was a breakfast room area, a kitchen, pantry, and an area where we had this big refrigerator. And you'd go upstairs and there was, on your right, pardon me, on your left as you went in was my grandmother's section where she had sort of a bedroom, a sitting room, and uh, her own bathroom. And then there was a long hall that went down the end to the only other bathroom. And then on your right was what we call the north room that was my parents' room. And behind that was this closet where there was a workshop and workbench that my father taught me how to use some things in there fairly early on. And then there was another guest room back in the back area with some stairs going back down into the kitchen area. Uh, and basically across the hall as you come at the, to across from my parents' room was uh, the room that, my, that I and later my brother and I shared and then it had two big sleeping porches because this was before homes were normally air conditioned and in East Texas in the summers it became pretty hot and so that was pretty much the layout of the house and in that day and time the great occupation that men had were hunting and fishing. Hunting, fishing, a great source of the protein. Uh, rarely ever did you see chickens in the grocery store. You kept your own chickens. I remember we would have, would kill one or two chickens on Sunday and they would be fried up for Sunday dinner. That was always the big Sunday dinner was fried chicken. And we had this peculiar thing that my mother had learned how to fix was rice. Most pit folks, potatoes were the uh, standard. And we had what was known as a Waldorf salad to go with it. And then we would have ice cream for dessert. And we didn't have a freezer. So someone would have to go downtown to the drugstore and get a couple of quarts of ice cream and then that would be our Sunday dessert and it had to all be eaten because there wasn't any way to keep it. And uh, the only thing you could freeze, we had a small compartment in the refrigerator where you could freeze ice cubes. And in the fall was hunting season and my father did a lot of quail and duck hunting. And he and some of his friends would go down to the coast and in the rice fields north of Rockport and Port Aransas and Corpus, they would get goose leases and they would, the geese would flock into these rice fields where they could feed and they could uh, uh, shoot geese as they came in. Uh, summer, people fished lakes there and when by the time I was three we'd started going down to Kima and my father and a doctor owned together a 24-foot cabin cruiser 
known affectionately as the bobtail. And we'd go out, fish in the bays, and go off the jetties in Galveston. And I remember at an early age, when I was about three or four, well, in Kima they had this marina where the, it wasn't known as a marina then, but it would be now, where they kept the boat. And my father was down talking to some people on another boat. And I fell in the water and I remember his pulling me out and insisted immediately thereafter that I take swimming lessons. And they had the old YMCA that had an indoor pool. And so that winter I was enrolled in swimming lessons. And about five years old I had learned how to swim. My paternal grandmother lived until 1939 and she passed away uh, I remember I was in school when it happened, and they sent someone up to tell the uh, school that my grandmother had died, and they took me home. I was nine years old at the time, and in the uh, fourth grade. And so my grandmother my paternal, grandma, paternal grandmother, two years before that, my Uncle Andrew, which was one of my father's brothers, uh, had and his wife had taken my grandmother by automobile to California. Now bear in mind, you're an unair conditioned automobile in the summer driving from Texas to California through New Mexico, Arizona, and a lot of the hot areas. But they went out and one of the things I remembered, if you've seen MGM pictures, you know the symbol is this lion that roars. Well, they went through one through the MGM studios and got to see that lion. And my grandmother allegedly petted it. I don't know, she had both hands <laughs> when it came back, so I assume all went well. And she used to tell me stories growing up and we would go downstairs at night and we would she would fix me a lemonade and uh, uh, so you know basically that was kind of our family set up my parents myself I had an Uncle Andrew and his wife would come to visit us. They lived in Fort Worth, and then one of my father's surviving sisters, Mabel, lived in uh, 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 Dallas. She married an oil man whose name was Sims, his was called Billy, and he was always known to us as Uncle Billy and Aunt Mabel. And then Irene had married a fellow by the name of Paul Harris who turned out to be a real jerk, and she was the only divorce in the family. And he was generally not spoken of. But she lived in Fort Worth, and she had two children, Janice and Roy. And Roy wanted to be a movie star in the cowboy movies. And so he went to California and then lived in New Orleans for a while, and Janice married a fellow by the name of Phil North and had a, raised a family. Uh, she had a daughter, Deborah, and I can't remember the son's name. And Janice would come down, and, and when we would go down to Kima in the summer before she was married, Janice would come down and stay for us, stay with us for a while, and uh, kind of acted as a babysitter for my brother and myself. And it's, our, our lives in Palestine were basically centered around the family. My parents were well off. They always had servants, somebody to cut the yard, someone to do the cooking, someone to clean the house. And uh, I remember we had this one cook, Mary Howard. And Mary was about five feet tall and weighed about 300 pounds. But she could fry chicken, 
and cook green beans and make cornbread like you wouldn't believe. And I used to sneak out and help her with the dishes sometimes. And my brother would come out there, but he tended to break things. And one of the episodes with my brother, now, of course, none of our children or your children ever fought or squabbled. But my brother and I did. And we had some pretty bloody knockdown drag outs. And one rainy Saturday afternoon when I was about six and he was about three, uh, we got into a tussle and I started chasing him. And he was rambling down the stairs away from me and I threw a shoe at him. And it cracked one of the panels in the stained glass windows on the stairs. Well, that was bad. Really, really bad. And so this was one of the things where this was during the Depression. My father worked Saturdays and sometimes Sundays. Uh, and the f mother didn't do anything. She said, wait until your father comes home. And that, that, that was a very serious, serious matter but for my brother and I. And so my father, as soon as he hit the house, his mother got after him. And then my mother got after him. Said, you've got to do something about Bill. And I got my bottom tan pretty fair on that. My brother also was made to sit in a chair for half an hour. That was our time out type of thing then. Because my father said, well, why didn't you catch the shoe? Why did you let it break the window? And uh, so he was not penalized as severely as I was. So that wasn't the end of it. My grandfather had a business partner, Solomon Meyer, known as Saul to everybody, Mr. Meyer to my brother and I. Very kindly gentleman. He gave, I remember he gave me a really nice tricycle when I was about four years old. And Mr. Meyer's son, Albert, was one of my father's best friends for many, many years. But we knew that they were rebuilding the Jewish synagogue and tearing down the one. It had stained glass windows. So my father got a glazier and he went over to the synagogue and found some panes that matched fairly closely the uh, thing that had been cracked. And the glazier replaced it. And there you can see a little bit of difference still. The last time I was in the house, you could see a little bit of difference between those two panes. They were, they were originally identical because they were cut from the same thing, but then you had just a, a, a small, small difference. And so all went well until my grandmother, who was a devout Irish Catholic, virtually to the point of being superstitious, uh, found out it came from Jewish synagogue, and she worried for years over whether or not it might be sinful to have a piece of glass from a Jewish synagogue in your home. That's a kind of thing. Uh, I think I'd mentioned to you that uh, men in the family was sort of a hunting society. Hunting season, everything stopped for the quail duck season. Uh, so I had this toy pop gun. It was, you could break it open the way you would a double barrel shotgun and it was double barrel and it had corks that would pop. It had a spring and you pull the trigger and they'd go literally a pop gun. And so one night my parents had some friends over for dinner and I was about three, maybe four years old and my bedroom was upstairs and I had a little bathrobe and slippers and I came down carrying my pop gun. And one of my father's friends said, Bill, where are you going? And I looked up at him and said very distinctly, my mother recalls, I'm going into the kitchen to hunt cockroaches. And I was hustled back upstairs. And my parents said it was a long time before they had a dinner party again. Uh, but my brother and I, 
we got along fine, and in later years, we became very close about a lot of things. Uh, but we were three years apart when we had our differences. Uh, Sundays, my father left the Catholic Church right about the time I was born. My mother, who was Presbyterian, had promised to raise her children Catholic when she married my father, and that's what she did. She had an interesting qualification for that. She and her brother were the first ones in the family to have a college education. My mother went to the University of Texas, as did my uncle Nupson, and he got a degree in engineering. My mother got a degree in English with a minor in Latin, and she was a high school teacher who taught Latin and English. So she would, when I turned six, she began taking me to Mass every Sunday. She always told me, Catholics go to Mass on Sunday. And so we would go to Mass. And she always sat up close to the front because she liked to hear the Latin. She could understand every word of it and was not above occasionally correcting the priest on his pronunciation. And it turned out that she did not understand the difference between ecclesiastical Latin that the church used and classical Latin that she had studied. And so after we would get back from church in the summers and in nice weather, my father would take my brother and I and my mother out to a place called Crystal Lake. And they had a clubhouse where you could get meals or stay overnight if you wanted to. And a beautiful lake. And we had a, uh, there was a boathouse and we had this rowboat named the Mabel after one of my aunts. And when I was about five years old, we'd go out there and my father had a collection of shotguns and he had a Savage 22 rifle. It was manufactured in 1910, according to the date on the barrel. And he would take it out and set up a can on a stick and shoot at it. And so I'd sit with him while he shot. And when I was five years old, he started holding the rifle up and teaching me how to do a sight picture and squeeze a trigger. And I got to the point where if he'd steady the gun and hold it, I could hit whatever the target was pretty well. All right, I'm going to pull you in now and we're going to start, we're going to keep going. What is your favorite childhood memory? I'm sorry? Your favorite childhood memory. You were talking about that. What is your favorite childhood memory looking back? Well, a lot of it are those times we went out to the lake and my, usually we practice shooting in the summertime and then in, or in, the, in the winter and in the summer when it was warm I'd, we could swim in the lake and we could fish off a pier that they had there and I used to catch these little rim. I remember that and learning how to hold a fish and take the hook out of its mouth and uh, we used cane poles and we catch these little brim about this long. Most of them would throw back because they weren't very good to eat. Uh, and my father, when I was about seven or eight, he started teaching me how to cast. And this was well before the date of time of uh, uh, spinning rods or spinning reels. And we had a spool. And you would cast and you had to regulate the speed with your thumb to keep it from backlashing. And if you didn't do it right, you get what we used to call a bird's nest in the uh, reel that you'd have to undo. So I remember a lot of that. Uh, the other things I remember is that, of course, bear in mind, this was well before the age of television. And after I got old enough, we'd go to the movies on Friday afternoons and Saturdays. We had three movie theaters, the Texas, which showed the first run movies with all the love stuff of Betty Grable and uh, Betty Davis and Robert Taylor and you know all, all these big sissy actors and uh, then they had two others that showed second run movies but the two others both on weekends had westerns comedies and serials and 
Friday afternoon after school, everybody would walk down and we'd go to the PAL, which was the closest one, and we'd watch the westerns and the serials and the comedies there. Saturday afternoon usually was sports. The boys would get out and there was no such thing as Little League or Pop Warner football or any of those things. And those of us who had parents who would teach us sports, and my father was good at that, uh, uh, and he taught me how to throw a baseball, how to bat, how to throw a football. And in the winter, we'd find a vacant lot someplace and we'd play tackle footballs. Some of us had partial uniforms, some had helmets, some didn't. But, you know, we were small and there was no one got, I don't rem ever remember anybody being hurt at it. Uh, and Saturday morning, the boys would get together and they would come home and our mothers would see to it that we took a bath because we were usually pretty grubby by that time. And uh, then we would go to the movies on Saturday afternoons. And as a special treat, every once in a while, our parents would take us at night to the big theaters. That was really a special treat. And uh, I remember my parents used to read to us a lot. And we had a complete collection of the Oz books. The Wizard of Oz was the first one, but then there was a long series of about 12, 13, 14 books. And we had a whole collection of those. And I, my parents would read to us. And when I went to school, I remember that I had trouble reading at first. And my father would sit down with me and work on my homework, as would my mother. Uh, my mother also taught me my catechism for my first communion. My father wasn't going to church in those days. And so we ended up, mother doing the religious education, but she basically was a Presbyterian. And she, with her Presbyterian upbringing, decided that it probably would not hurt us, even though we were Catholics, if she read to us from the Bible, which she did on occasion. I remember those things very fondly. Because she did it in a very loving manner. And I remember my parents were fairly strict in terms of being disciplinarians. But both of them, when they had to correct us, I can't ever remember they're displaying real anger. It was more like they were trying to teach us something. And I thought, I, looking back on it, they were good parents. Growing up, what was your favorite vacation? You know, going on vacation if you did, what was your favorite vacation? Okay, when I was about starting four, we used to go down to Kima. And we rented this house about halfway between Seabrook, the Seabrook Kima area, and I can't remember, but there's another little town up the road, Port Aransas. And uh, we uh, stayed there usually for a month. And my father would come down for the first week and we'd go fishing with him and he'd take the boat out and we'd uh, have the cabin cruiser. And then he would be gone for two weeks and then come back for the fourth week. And my mother would, we would go crabbing on the piers. And we had a live box where we'd catch crabs and put them in the live box and we wanted to cook crabs. <clears throat> we'd take a wash tub and build a fire on the beach, put salt water in it and boil the crabs, ice them down and we'd have live crabs. And uh, not, not well, crabs that were cooked live and then they were iced down and uh, cold boiled crabs. And we used to go down to Platts' boat yard and that, it was in Galveston County. And at that time, Galveston County was wide open and they had this place where you could get hamburgers and beer, soda pop, and they had slot machines. And they had 
nickel, dime, and quarter slot machines. And sometimes our parents would give my brother and I a dollar's worth of nickels and see how long we could play the slot machines with them. All right, so tell me, um, what high school did you go to and what uh, did you guys do when you were in high school for fun? Okay, for high school, when high school started, what I had wanted to do, this was in 1945. When high school started, I had wanted to go to one of the military academies, so instead of going to the regular high schools in Houston, uh, I went off to a school, New Mexico Military Institute. And it was boarding school. They organized you into squads, platoons, companies. Uh, you had your regular high school courses and you had two hours of military training every day. Uh, close order drill, extended order tactical marches. Uh, and the first two years, we were trained in horse cavalry, i.e. we would go out, saddle a horse, learn how to ride in formations, uh, go out and the last thing you would do in every drill period, you'd go out and you'd have a charge. And we'd have usually two, two troops uh, of two platoons each and they would be spread out and you would gallop as fast as you could across the prairie out on the big maneuver area that the school had. And uh, uh, after military training every day, everyone had to go out for some form of athletics, either interscholastic or intramural. And for the first three years, I played on the junior varsity football team. And then when football season was over, the first year I had intended to try to learn to play basketball, but I messed up my ankle the first year. Uh, and so I was out of sports for uh, about six weeks. So then I picked up and boxed because the boxing team was the next thing that was up. Uh, and then in the spring played intramural softball uh, and other games. They did not have any intramural basketball. Go ahead. Now, if, you know, it was a boarding school, I'm assuming there was no opportunity for high schoolers to get into trouble around there. It was, it was pretty, uh, pretty... We awesome. made our own opportunities to be mischievous. And, the, you know, you've got all these regulations and our form of mischief was finding some way not to do what the regulations required you to do or to do something they forbade you from doing. And the uh, second year I was there, I got a job working in the library, shelving books, doing chores like that. And then the third year I was there, I got into what was a really the plum job that I kept for that year and the next was working in what we used to call the PX, which was a soda fountain. And cadets in there off time could get soft drinks, snacks, and whatever. If you worked there, you got all that for free. Uh, and cadets were given an allowance of uh, uh, $2 a week. And you would have the first two years I was there, we were given Monday afternoons off. We would have Sunday from after lunch until a parade, and they would have a formal parade where you put on your dress uniform and the whole regiment would go out and they'd bring out the band and you would march and strut around. And uh, You know, you've seen the pictures of the West Point cadets. Well, that was kind of like us, except our uniforms were different. Uh, they would have dances twice a month. And you could, 
if you could get a date, you could bring a date to the dance. You could not drive an automobile, but you could get a taxi ride for about 35 cents a trip, and which meant that you were spending what's four times 35 dollar 20 something for transportation and uh, uh, two dollar a week allowance. That's a big expenditure. And uh, uh, later, what I ended up doing, they moved the dances from the gymnasium over to a, a sort of a ballroom area they had adjacent to the PX, and they would keep the soda fountains open, and you could work. You'd get paid. We were paid the minimum wage, which at that time was 35 cents an hour. And I went there for uh, when I found out I finally was not going to be able to get into either of the service academies. Uh, I decided I wanted something as different from the military as I could find. And that turned about out to be the University of Texas, which that's, as they say in East Texas, that's a whole nother story. Uh, but you skipped over something that might be significant. You'd ask me about favorite vacations. This wasn't my favorite, but it turned out to be one of the more important ones. 1939, uh, that summer, my parents took an automobile trip to California with my brother and I and they brought along this young woman to kind of babysit with them so they could go out and do stuff uh, th that they wanted to do. And I didn't realize the significance of babysitters until much later. So we drove to California in the summer of 1939, stayed for a while at Long Beach. The Pacific Fleet was based at Long Beach at that time. And on Sundays, you could go out and visit the ships. And so one Sunday when we were there, or I guess the Sunday we were there, my father took us down to the Navy docks. And my brother and I were very upset with him because we wanted to see a battleship. You know, you'd see those in the newsreels, the pictures. Of, well, my father, he was curious about something else. He wanted to look at an aircraft carrier. So we went out and visited the USS Lexington, the first Lexington, and got a tour of the ship and had ice cream in the uh, sailors' sort of canteen things, and came back and I remember seeing these funny looking two winged airplanes down in the hangar deck below that. And so we came back and at that point, neither my brother nor I were especially impressed with an aircraft carrier, for heaven's sakes. What were those gadgets? Uh, we went up, from there we went down to San Diego and went across into Monterey, then came back up the Pacific Coast and stayed in San Francisco that was having one of the world's fairs. There was one in New York that year, one in San Francisco. And so we went to the World's Fair. And they had a dummy mock-up of a gold mine. And I remember my brother and I being frightened that we had lots, had seen, heard lots of news broadcasts and seen news, newsreels of mines that had collapsed. And so we were scared that this dummy thing was obviously was not going to. But nine years old, your technical knowledge is not very extensive at that point. And uh, we left from San Francisco and then drove back home. This was in late August and the first days of September 1939. World War II was breaking out. The car that we had then was a Buick and it was only the second car we had that had a radio in it. I mean, we look at an automobile now and you've got all the uh, 
dashboard television thing where you can see backing up and you've got a radio and you've got a heater and you've got air conditioning. You have power steering, you have a automatic transmission. Well, a fully loaded car in that day, you got manual transmission, no power steering, and uh, you could get a radio and a heater. And the first cars didn't have heaters in them. And so we drove back and listening to the news with the war breaking out about all the things you'd get a broadcast from uh, repeating something that heard from Poland or England or France <coughs> where the Germans had shot somebody on the Polish border or then the German broadcast where the Poles had shot somebody on the German side of the border. And you listen to all of that and by the time we got back to Palestine in the first couple of days of September, World War II had started. And at that time, my grandmother's health began to fail more and more. Uh, that fall, she passed away, my paternal grandmother, my paternal grandmother. And they split up the family businesses. My father inherited as his part uh, the interest in Houston. And so in 1940, we moved to Houston. And I was 10 at the time. My brother was uh, uh, seven. When we were in California, we had gotten a letter of introduction to the Withers family, who knew some tenants of my father's. And we got an invitation into the 20th Century Fox Studios and got to visit Jane Withers on the uh, uh, studio, vit filming a school called High School. And we had our picture taken with them. And I've got in the pictures of the family pictures the thing of my brother and I uh, with Jane Withers' arms around us. She's smiling and my brother and I looking like two biggest goofs you've ever seen in your life. And, uh, 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 but we did not get to see any of the Westerns being made and that was a big disappointment to us. Well, of course I went to junior high school in Houston mm -hmm. and I think the first girl I kissed was a girl by the name of Eleanor Abney. And we were on a train trip to San Antonio and we went through this area where the thing was dark and all the boys tried to kiss the girls and Eleanor happened to be the closest. And uh, what about um, was the first serious uh, relationship you ever had was it was with uh, their mom? Yeah, or it was. So there was um, never one before that. Like I know, well, I never had a regular girlfriend that I dated on a regular basis for any extended period of time. Uh, when we used to go down to the Rockport in the summers. There, when in my teenage years, that is where we used to take our vacations then, or in Rockport. There was some, a family down there, the Daniels, and they had some daughters, and there was a, a Sally Daniel and her sister Betty, uh, and Sally and I would walk together on the pier. We never kissed her, never had any serious romantic thing in it. And at New Mexico, uh, you know, there, every once in a while you would get a kiss, kiss good night from your date to the dance or something like that. But, uh, you know, really you did not have that much of a romantic life during high school. And uh, then, of course, junior high, you're too young to drive. And uh, junior high was during the war. And after we had moved to Houston, we first lived in a house out on South Main that later became a restaurant, the Red Line Inn. And there was some woods back behind it, and my brother and I and some of our friends used to go back down in the woods and look for birds and frogs and things to shoot at with BB guns. And we would go down, hike, and walk through the woods and things like that. 
we would get a ride to the movies on Saturday mornings and we could see a western and a serial, but they weren't as good as the ones in Palestine. And what about, what is, um, you know, the last few things from childhood, what do you consider your most fond memory of your mother growing up? I guess I remember most my mother taking me to church on Sunday because she was always in church, she was sort of displayed an affection for my brother and I. Uh, she did at other times too, but she always made a point of that. I remember her doing that, and I remember later on my mother, uh, I remember uh, later when she took over the cooking, she was a great cook, and she would sit and tell us stories and I, I, I recall that. I don't really remember any of the stories, uh, but uh, uh, she would read the Bible to us on occasion, and she'd read other books. And when we were, before we learned to read ourselves, and even some after that, she would read the Oz books to us. And I remember there was another group of books that I used to read and they were called the Jerry Todd books. And it was about a group of teenage boys and how they were growing up through high school and uh, different things that they did. And they had a whole series of them. They were written by a fellow by the name of Leo Edwards, as I recall. And I think we had a collection of 10 or 12, maybe more of those. And uh, initially, uh, they would read to us. And then my, some of my uncle Nupson's books over at my grandmother's house of young people who were having adventures in the West and that type of thing. Uh, and initially my mother read to us a lot. And then finally, about the third grade, I learned how to read pretty well myself by that time. And reading has been a lifelong addiction of mine. So what about your father? Um, the most fond memory you have with your father? After I turned about 12 or 13, he and I started doing a lot of competitive 16-yard trap shooting. 12-gauge shotgun, 16 yards from the uh, house. They would throw out targets and shoot at them, and we did that competitively. And after my mother would take my brother and I to church, my father would take, us, take me to the gun club. Pete never really got into that. And I remember when I was in junior high school, all the kids were getting Cushman motor scooters. And I wanted one. And my father, didn't, he didn't want to get it for me. And he finally told me, he said, Bill, if you'll get off my back about the motor scooter. Those were not his exact words, but he just said, if you stop asking for the motor scooter, when you turn 13, I'll give you a good shotgun. I mean, that would, in this politically correct gun fear age, that would be something that would be virtually unheard of. And so I would rather have, have had the shotgun. And he gave me a Winchester Model 12 that he had had when he was 12 years old. He sent it back to the Winchester Repeating Arms Company and had it rebuilt and reblued. Uh, Nick now has that. I gave Nick my collect his the shotguns I got from my father. But I remember my father and I doing that. He also, uh, we would go down to Rockport in the summers, and he and I would go out and fish for speckled trout. And he taught me how to cast, how to bait the hooks, how to take care of and clean the fish and that type of thing. And I remember all those things I did with my father because uh, he was a great teacher. Uh, I mean, one ironic thing, I'm left-handed. He was right-handed. So when he taught me sports, he taught me sports. I played baseball and tennis and golf and fish, all right-handed. I played ping pong, badminton, and racquetball left-handed. 
can use tools generally with both hands. So were you closer to him growing up than your mother? Uh, you I'd say it's about 50-50. There were some things I was closer to him, there were some things I was closer to my mother. When you graduated, um, what did you do you know, after you graduated high school? Well, uh, you mean after my high school graduation? Well, I went home from New Mexico Military Institute and I had a job working in an oil field warehouse, loading trucks, taking equipment and stuff apart. And my father told, wanted my brother and I both to, at some point in our lives, do some real manual labor. And that we work for McCarthy Oil and Gas. And that would be our summer job. One summer, after my first year of college, I went to Fort Hood from our ROTC summer training and we were in the second arm with the second armor division in their tanks and we fired tank weapons on the tank ranges. We went out to the rifle ranges and qualified with M1 Garand rifles and then uh, learned how to shoot pistols and submachine guns and uh, would take turns leading the platoon or being the platoon sergeant or the company commander because we were actually officers in training. And my next year I had one year of ROTC left when I went to the University of Texas and I finished that there in an engineer company. And But I got my commission in tanks. Or formally it's called armor. Since you're talking about those different positions, what's the worst position in the army and or job you've ever had? Okay. You did not enjoy. Worst thing related to the military was my first year in military school. The hazing was sometimes brutal. You had to run everywhere you went. You had to I'll call anybody who'd been there uh, past their first year, sir. And uh, you had to uh, uh, be just thoroughly subordinated. You had to sit at detention at meal times. Uh, the old cadets sat at the end of the table. You sat in the middle. If they had a milk glass or a water glass that they'd finished, they'd bang it on the table and throw it at you and you had to fill it up for them. You had to sit on the first two inches of your chair at attention and eat square meals for one year. That was not fun. Uh, Best job I ever had, the best experience, was when I was an assistant United States attorney. And I started off four years in the criminal division, and we tried the criminal cases that were bought by the FBI, the Secret Service, the postal inspectors, IRS special agents, uh, uh, virtually anybody else and we would have these terms of court in Laredo and we'd have 150 to 200 people in jail and we'd have six weeks to get those cases disposed of and we'd send three lawyers down to the border run the cases through the grand jury and get indictments have arraignments then start trying jury cases Try a jury case, we'd have one lawyer trying the case, another lawyer helping him, the third lawyer getting the next case ready. As soon as the jury went out, they'd bring another jury venire in, office, first chair, first chair, second chair, second chair, office. And just keep that rotation as long as it took. And it was fun. It was strenuous. It, we were working 16, 17, 18 hour days. But to they, but it was it was really fun. We're gonna jump from that and uh, talk about you know your love of your career right there. So tell me about the, when you first met the love of your life. Where did you guys meet and um, just the whole shebang that we'll go into. Okay, well, 
uh, Lee and I both transferred into the University of Texas as sophomores. That meant that you registered on the second day of registration at Gregory Gym. We both had to take an English class, a sophomore English class. By the time we had registered, the people who had been there their first year at Texas, they had taken up, they knew what the good English classes were, and they were filled by the time we got there. And we, we both ended up separate and independently signing up for this course, English Literature, Beowulf through Burns. Have either of you ever read Beowulf? Okay. Well, we were, the course was taught by Dr. Willard in a first floor classroom in Sutton Hall. And so we were assigned seats and this young woman sitting in front of me visited with everybody just, as you'll remember, you know, Nana was very sociable. She liked people. And I was kind of withdrawn. I, I didn't say much to anybody, but I noticed she, I thought she was pretty cute. And she didn't really care a great deal for me. And she was much more interested in a lot of the guys in that class that are much smoother. But she was not reading the assignment very carefully. And so uh, most of the guys that she was interested weren't either, but she would ask me about it, and I was studying the course. I, I, I kind of liked this stuff. And so I'd fill her in on what the assignments were. And so one day we had this pop quiz, and I had briefed her on it. And the papers came back, and she got an A minus, and I got an F. And I looked at it, and I thought I'd written a pretty good paper. And I went up and he said, well, you got an F because I think you're copying off the young woman in front of you because you both made the same mistake. And I told her about it and she went up and I had made a mistake on it. And uh, uh, so he called me up and said, well, he said, young lady, you should have been studying your course. And he said, young man, you need to take her to the library and make an honest woman out of her. And so he gave both of us a C. So this goes on, and I tried to date her, and she didn't want to date me. She always, always busy, always had a date, always had some activity. And so this goes on until, oh, right around Thanksgiving. I can't remember whether it was before or after Thanksgiving. So finally I said, look, your reasons for not wanting to do something with me, no human being could be as busy as you've told me you were. And you would have dropped dead of exhaustion because you wouldn't have had time to sleep. And so I said, I'll make you a deal. Pick out something this weekend for one hour that we can do together. You name it, we'll do it. You and me, one hour. And she got a brilliant idea of how to get rid of me. She said, you can take me to church. So then I had to ask her a question because at that time, Catholics were not permitted to go to a Protestant service under pain of mortal sin. You guys know the post-Vatican II rule, but th this is this is old church. And so I said, well, what church do you go to? And she said, with this expression on her face like, you fool, why are you asking me this? What else is there? I'm Catholic. And so I had a mischievous streak that surfaced. And I said, well, I don't mind going to a Catholic church. I was still going to Mass. I even went to confession from time to time. So I got to thinking, she wants to see a Catholic. I'll show her a Catholic. 
So I picked her up from the church, was about five blocks from her boarding house, and I didn't have a car then, so we walked down to the church, and she walks in, goes to the holy water font. I looked at her, and did the same thing in Jenner's Lake, so it was time to go to communion. I went up and went to communion with her, and, she's, and she is furious with me. And she remarked to me, and I'll remember it, just infuriated, said, you're going to hell. And I said, why? She said, well, you receive communion, you're not Catholic. I said, well, what makes you think I'm not Catholic? She said, are you Catholic? I said, yes. And she said, well, why didn't you tell me? I said, well, you didn't ask. And she started laughing. And so I said, well, okay, you've done your hour. I won't talk to you again except help you with the course as you need it. Or I've got an alternative proposal. Let's go across the street and have breakfast. So we sat two hours over breakfast and started talking. And after that, we started dating and kept on going to Mass together. And that kind of was the start of our time together. And, and then how long did you guys date before you were married? Well, I guess probably after midterm, we were dating pretty much exclusively, and we had that semester and two more years at college that we dated. And uh, uh, I graduated, and uh, Lee had gotten a case of ulcers and uh, had done badly in one semester because she was out of school for almost two months and never was able to make it up completely. And uh, so she had finished everything on her degree except her practice teaching. And I had switched over from chemistry to business administration. And I got my degree, my commission in the Army, and my orders to active duty on the same day. And I had given her an engagement ring the last semester we were in college, but we hadn't set a date or anything because, you know, I had no idea where the Army was going to send me or what I was going to be doing or if it would be at all possible, you know, to get married and have a home. And so uh, uh, when I got my orders, I knew I was going to the Army School at Fort Knox for a 90-week course, 90 days course. And uh, uh, then that summer we decided to get married Saturday after Thanksgiving. Uh, well, we were sitting in my car, and I told her, I said, you know, I really care for you a lot, and she said, well, I, I love you too. And I said, I want to marry you, and I, I'm not in a position to do it now, but I'd like for you to have this ring, and I took the ring out of my pocket and gave it to her. Well, how beautiful she was. She was re really absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the wedding, I was finished the armored school course the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. A buddy of mine and I took off in my car for Dallas, and he was going to catch a plane from Dallas to Corpus. And we stopped off in Bowling Green, Kentucky to get something for dinner. Went into the bus station, I got corned beef and cabbage, and I got food poisoning on the way to Dallas the Wednesday before the wedding. I got in to Dallas about 7.30, 8 o'clock, went to my wife's parents' home. She came to the door. I kissed her and threw up. And I went back. My parents were at the Baker Hotel, and I went down to their suite of rooms and I just laid down and I was gone all day Thanksgiving. And finally got over it. My her doctor sent me some medicine to take and I finally got my stomach settled. 
And uh, this was Thursday, Thanksgiving. So the next day I got up, we went down, got the marriage license at the city hall and had to go to the, her doctor and get a blood test that you had to do then to get a marriage license and had the rehearsal dinner that night. And at that time, you could only have a mass that started before 12 noons. And so uh, for nuptial weddings, they were always in the morning. Well, this was during the Korean War. Saturday after Thanksgiving, you had a lot of military people who wanted to get married that weekend. And so they had weddings scheduled at her church every half hour from 7.30 until five minutes of 12. We got 10.30. And so I got up, had breakfast with my parents, and put on my tux and went to the church. And everybody was all dressed up on their black tux. And I was, shall we say, rather uneasy at the time. And so we had 30 minutes to get our flowers and stuff on the altar do the mass and get our flowers off and take the pictures. 30 minutes of the whole thing. And Monsignor Bender did the mass and the wedding in 20 minutes flat, including a five minute sermon. And Lee came down the aisle with her father. All I could see just absolutely beautiful. And I've got some photographs of her in her wedding dress and everything. Um, she's going to show you guys at some other time. And so we went to the reception at her home and her father did not believe in drinking in the morning so we had no booze at the reception. And so we cut the wedding cake and Lee and I finally left the reception and so we weren't going to be able to get into our hotel room until uh, uh, 4.30. So her father had very thoughtfully bought us tickets to the TCU-SMU football game that day. Remember, no professional ball clubs other beyond AA uh, baseball in Texas at the time. No Dallas Cowboys, no Houston, Texas. Uh, no San Antonio Spurs, uh, no Houston Astros, no Dallas, uh, Texas. And so we left and we changed into her, quote, going away suit. And I changed into my Class A Army uniform. And so we got in the car and we left and she turned to me and she said, Bill said, you're my husband now, aren't you? I said, yes. She said, you're supposed to take care of me, aren't you? And I said, well, of course. And she said, well, I'm hungry. Feed me. And so she'd fasted from midnight. In the Army communion, you could receive communion any time after an hour when you'd last eaten. And so we uh, stopped on the way to the football game, and I bought her a barbecue sandwich and a beer. Well, we didn't have uh, McDonald's back then. We didn't have the fast food stuff, and but we had the barbecue sandwich. We went on to the football game and left at halftime. And we went to a nice restaurant that night for dinner. And. Uh, uh, these friends of ours had a ranch down in central Texas and we went down there. Uh, they lived in Big Spring and the ranch was sort of a hobby thing and we went down and uh, spent the part of our wedding trip just 
hiking there in the woods down on the Pertinalis River. How did Miss Lee tell you um, the first time she was pregnant? How did she let you know? Well, we were up at Port Knox, and uh, she asked to use the car that day and drove me in to work at the gunnery committee. I was teaching tank gunnery at the 3rd Armored Division. And so we came back that night. I came, or she picked me up that night, and on the way home, she was driving us back to the apartment and said, I've got great news. We're going to have a baby. And she had gone over to the Army medical facilities that dependents used, and they, she had, was late on her uh, menstrual cycle, and so consequently, she wanted to have that checked out, and she, the rabbit died, and uh, so we knew we were expecting. Did y'all tell family right away, or did y'all wait? Within a couple of days. And um, how did y'all try for a long time before um, she was pregnant, or? No, we just kind of had let nature take its course. I mean. This is probably February or so of uh, uh, one, uh, 1953. And uh, we were married in November before that. And so, you know, we really hadn't given it much thought until, you know, we found out that, uh, you know, she was in fact pregnant. And. Uh, we had written my maternal grandmother, Mrs. Hughes. Uh, Miss Lily, as everybody called her, or Mamo, as I, my brother and I called her. And uh, the last letter we wrote to her, we told her we were expecting a baby. Uh, she died the next month. And my mother said she found our letter open among her things. And everybody was all excited about it. And uh, uh, so I had gone through the armored school at Fort Knox uh, as the initial assignment. It was 90 days, and what we did was the classroom and field work that the OCS did. And it was uh, gunnery, communications, tactics, administrative procedures, everything they teach the 90-day wonders in OCS. Our difference was that when we were finished at night, we could go to the officer's club and have a beer and get a hamburger, and the uh, OCS people had to go back, eat in the mess hall, and scrub the barracks. But when we were there, we had ROTC and West Point people. And in the armored school, the three principal schools that were there were West Point, New Mexico Penitentiary Institute, Texas A&M, and the University of Georgia. And we lived in these BLQs that had sort of grass spaces between them. And we had a flag football game we played on Saturday afternoons. And then some of us were concerned because the Korean War was going on at that time. And people were getting killed. And we were in a combat unit. And we were concerned that, well, maybe this business of going over and having a beer after work and sitting around. So we started several of a bunch of us, 15, 20 out of the 200 started getting up five every morning doing calisthenics and running a couple of miles. And when we took the courses, most of it I had had before at New Mexico Military Institute. And then in the gunnery thing, the hard part about tank gunnery is hitting a moving target. With all of the competitive trap shooting I'd done, I knew how to do that. And so when we finished the class, and the grading overall 
I was number seventh in a class of 200 and some odd. And I was beaten out by three West Pointers, two Aggies, and another NMMI guy. And I had the second highest gunnery score. And so consequently, instead of getting sent out to the boonies to sleep in the mud with the trainees, I got to get in the classroom, run a gunnery range, and uh, work in the background of the gunnery instruction. And one of the things I did while I was there was they were switching over the tanks in Europe from the M4s and M26s that they used in World War II to the new M47s that had an entirely different gunnery system on them and an entirely different maintenance system. And our group was the first one trained on those tanks. And so we trained partially M4s and M46s and then M47s on the gunnery committee. And uh, so the commanding officer gave me the job of rewriting the lesson plans for the new M47s on the gunnery instruction part of it, which I did. And he gave me an outstanding efficiency report rating for the work I'd done, so I got sent to Germany to the 7th Army Tank Training Center. And we ran courses for tank crewmen, mechanics, motor officers, and regimental tank companies training on the new M47 tanks. And I stayed in Germany for a year. Lee didn't get to go. Uh, we had, she had had a miscarriage and we lost the baby before I went overseas. So was that y'all's um, first child uh, y'all yeah. lost was a miscarriage? Yeah. Um, how, when you, what was the most significant thing or did anything what did you take away from your time going to Europe, you know, your um, time over there, living over there, or, or being in the military at that time? Was there any kind of significant impact in your life that you think uh, changed you or changed kind of your opinion? Or well, there were two things. I was initially still thinking maybe a military career. And one of the things I saw where military families were separated a great deal. And a lot of them, I saw a lot of families that had broken up. And I was not able to get Lee over to Germany because I didn't have enough time left. You had to have at least a year left from the time that she would have arrived until the time you were released from active duty. And I think I had something like nine and a half months left. And so I couldn't get her over there. And what I saw was that if you followed a military career, you were going to be separated from your family a great deal. And with our time together at Knox, we had a home, we had a community of friends there. And I had come to the conclusion that's what I wanted. And I wanted to be part of a community. One thing that was kind of rattling around in the back of my mind was that in college, when I switched over to business, they had mandatory business law courses that were taught by the law school. And everybody, except a very few of us, hated them. They were taught by law school professors who were, they, they'd get you up and cross-examine you in class and just kind of try to make a fool out of you. And I took that as kind of a challenge. I always did pretty well on them. And I started being interested in law, and I found out I could get into the University of Texas College of Law, and also that I was eligible under the GI Bill to get some financial support while if I went there. So I wrote back and forth to Lee. We wrote each other almost every day. And I still have her letters, and she kept all of mine that I still have. And I read them and just, 
If I was thinking about some third party, I didn't know they'd be hilarious. But, uh, and so, Korean War ended and they decided to let everybody out 90 days early. And so I got to come home. But before I had left Germany, this captain I worked for that I was really liked, and he's a great guy, a really good officer, he had a heart attack. And for four weeks I took over and was commanded our section until they brought in a major to take over the job. I was a first lieutenant by then. And I had one experience. A friend of mine from New Mexico Military Institute, who had also been a roommate of mine at Texas, and he'd gotten his commission the same day I did, met, became engaged to, and married this young woman down in Heidelberg. He was with the 2nd Army Division uh, uh, at Baumholter. And so he asked me to be in the wedding. And this was during the time that I was running the section. And so he asked me to be down there for five days. And so I went in and I asked the CEO if I could get to leave. And he said, Bill, look, you're the only experienced officer we've got in that section. And, uh, you know, we really can't do it right now. So I said, fine. I went back and I called my friend. And about 30 minutes later, the uh, loudspeaker says, Lieutenant Bowers, report to the commanding officer immediately. And I thought, shit. What have I done? I mean, he wasn't mad at me 30 minutes ago, so I came up and he looked at me and like I was the biggest fool who ever lived. And he said, for God's sakes, why didn't you tell me it's the general's daughter's wedding you were going to? He's the second in command of the U.S. 8th Army in Europe. Uh, and uh, said, of course you're going. He said, well, currently, I mean, I didn't want to sound like I was trying. He said, look, you're going to that wedding, and you're going to be there all five days, and I've got some people I want you to see while you're in Heidelberg, and don't you be shy about telling them you're there for the general's daughter's wedding. And so I went to Heidelberg and talked to some people about some supply and personnel problems we were having, and did mention that I have, was there because uh, I happened to be in town for the general's daughter's wedding, and I was in the wedding party. And so we had a round of partying the like of which I have ne had never seen before or since. And we had this, when we went in, I got there on, by train and we went up and they had a tea dance at what they called the Makoten, which is under the Heidelberg Castle. This big room, which was the German General Officers Club, which was the U.S. General Officers Club. And so it was restricted to generals, and colonels and their guests. Well, I was a guest. So they had, well, the guy I was staying with was the intelligence officer for the uh, 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 7th Army. And he said, you might want to take it easy on the booze because we're leaving from there to a cocktail party to a dinner party. And so I sipped a little bit of wine and kind of wandered around, talked to people, and then went to the cocktail party where they had the hard stuff. And then went to the dinner party where they had a happy hour before dinner. And then the next day, my guest took me and my buddy and his fiance on a tour around Heidelberg. And we went up in this castle and he pointed out where all the Russian spies were. And I said, well, why don't you arrest him? He said, well, they just send some more in and we know where all of these are. And we went back and went to the rehearsal dinner that night and uh, had the wedding the next morning and they issued all of us a saber. And <coughs> in our Class A uniforms with the same brown belt and the sabers and we uh, formed the traditional arch of swords at the church door and the best man swatted the bride on the rump with his saber. And uh, 
My friend stayed in the Army and retired as a Brigadier General and went to work in his daughter's law office as a paralegal. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get digressed, but thought that might be interesting. Strikes you as like, oh yeah, that was uh, that was you know an incredible time we had, or what we did. Or, you know. Well, uh, the latter part of our wedding trip turned out to be a lot of fun. We drove to Fort Knox through New Orleans and stayed in New Orleans for about three days, and wandered around the art galleries, and then down Bourbon Street, and had dinner at. Uh, uh, we didn't go to Antoine's. I guess we went to Galator's and uh, had dinner there and uh, really just, uh, and I remember going one night to the Court of Two Sisters and having a, a brandy there. It uh, was the last thing we did. And uh, that was fun. And. I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Um, you know, after you guys had children, what was the most fond memory with all of them together? Was it a vacation or was it just a, a you know, something that you guys did around here? But, you know, what comes up is... Oh, gosh. I remember one story you had told me before about water skiing. You guys yeah. Well, my father had always had boats, and after the bobtail, he had a 38-foot Matthews that he sold, and then he had another boat that he bought after the war. And so I liked to be around the water, and I had learned a lot about boats and water safety. And so Lee and I, after I got out of the Army, I had a reserve obligation. and. We settled in, and Lee was pregnant. Well, the, the, the kids were six kids within a 10-year span, so we had a lot of pregnancies there. And so uh, it was, but the, uh, when I got back from overseas, I was assigned to Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, in an infantry training division. And I stayed in until my discharge date without taking any leave. And we were up there at Chaffee. But on the way up there, uh, we uh, just kind of had a nice trip and we stayed, we found a, a, a little tourist court that had a kitchenette in it that we stayed in. And it was kind of a fun time. We had some trips we took on the weekend just driving around places. And then I went back and got into law school and would you believe it was nine years before we took a vacation? Because when my two weeks would come, I had to go back to the Army for two weeks. And I went through law school in my first jobs. And then when I went to work for the U.S. Attorney's Office, they would give me military leave so I would get a vacation in addition to my military service. And the first vacation we had and was we went down to Rockport and they had these little <coughs> cottages up on this hill <coughs> overlooking the bay with these two long piers where my family used to go. Well, we had six children. This was in August and Anna had been born in June. And so we got a trailer and put her baby beds, bassinet, all the baby paraphernalia in it on uh, um, my father's old outboard motor, fishing gear and stuff, and drove to Rockport. And it had two rooms, one with two big beds in it, and the boys got one, and the girls got the other. 
and Lee and I and Anna were in the other bedroom. It had two window air conditioners in it. And so we stayed there and I ran two fishing trips a day. We rented an aluminum boat and I had my father's old motor and we'd go out to these close-in reefs and we'd catch speckled trout and I would clean them and Lee would cook them. It turned out the kids and I had a great time. Your grandmother later described it to me as she felt like she was somebody's galley slave. And so she came and said, you know, I like Rockport and I'm glad the kids had a good time. But we got to have better accommodations than this and you got to be prepared to take us out to eat a lot more. And so we started renting places over in Key Allegra, which was a development that people would have vacation homes and you could rent. And so we started going there for a while and we went up to the Highland Lakes and we had a friend who had a house up there we could rent for <coughs> a month in the summer. And the second year we were in Rockport, I bought a 14-foot boat with a 25 horsepower motor that we could do. And I traded up to that on a used 18, 17 footer with a 65 horsepower engine and the kids started to learn how to water ski. And then I later traded that off on a 19 foot boat with an 85 horsepower engine on it that they could ski better. And so uh, Lee could run the boat and she could water ski. and. Uh, and I think your question was, what was my favorite activity with them? I think those vacations were when we could get out and uh, use the boat and swim and just be together and do things. And uh, uh, we bought, when we moved to Houston, Mary Ellen had been born while I was in law school. And Murph was born a year after we moved to Houston. And we lived over in Westview until we bought this place in Briargrove and then finally had too many kids for that and we bought the old place over on Taylor Crest right down the road. And Lee and I, we bought paint and tools and lumber and whatever. And the, the house was in a very rundown condition and we remodeled it and rebuilt it. And then later, if we'd been there for about nine years, we added a bedroom and enlarged it in and split up the big bedroom for the boys. And we had uh, two bedrooms and a bath for the girls and two bedrooms and a bath for the boys and then the big master bedroom for Lee and I. And uh, we used to have, the big thing was in the fall, the leaves all fell down off the trees. And we had over 100 trees with a trunk in excess of one foot in diameter on the lot and a lot most of them are hardwood and they shed a lot of pine needles and oak and maple leaves and we'd have to rake them up and for a while they'd let you burn them and have these big fall bonfires and uh, most of the kids would pitch in some of them who will remain unnamed were less than enthusiastic about the work but we'd get together and do these things and uh, you know I'd chicken and steaks and hamburgers on the grills on Saturday nights. And we had a place to park the boat under a tarpaulin. And then later when we enlarged the place, I built a two car garage with a carport next to it where we'd keep the boat in one car. And on Sundays we would, in the summer, we'd maybe go to church on Saturday and hook the boat up and we'd go up to Lake Somerville and water ski and we had a another family that had a boat that Murph was dating one of their daughters in high school and they're really nice folks and uh, then uh, uh, all of the kids water skied and Lee did too as a matter of fact and uh, those are kind of outings and things we'd have and uh, then Pardon? When they were growing up with the, the kids, what was your favorite age with them? Oh gosh, I'm trying to, well, it, 
it was neither 2 nor 13. Uh, I guess 16 or 17 when they were starting to emerge from their teenage things and you could, you know, really do and talk to think, talk with them about things. And then in the earlier ages, probably the earlier uh, elementary school things when they were first starting to have their activities and stuff. And uh, uh, when we could get together, we'd have, usually everybody would show up for dinner, except later when their activities got too busy, we would have dinner in shifts. And when we did the remodeling on a house on Taylor Crest, at least specified that we have warming drawers so she could fix a meal for everybody. And then we'd have one shift where the girls would have to then go out to gymnastics and then uh, the boys would come in from football or basketball practice or Mary Ellen would come in from ballet. And Lee and I would sit down with whoever was there for dinner and kind of snack wasn't really good for your waistline and probably was not nutritionally really good. But uh, those, those were fun times we had. And one thing I tried to share with Lee and later with the family was my work. And when I was with the United States Attorney's Office, I enjoyed all of it, but probably the most enjoyable part of it was when I ran the real estate division. And I had a land condemnation, including the condemnation of 110,000 acres for land on the Padre Island National Seashore. And we had three jury trials over a six or 18 month period. And one of them lasted seven weeks, one of them four weeks, and the last one six weeks. And that's a long time to be out of town in trial. And so Lee came down to hear the jury arguments on all of them and on the last one that was in Brownsville she loaded all six of the kids in the station wagon and drove 375 miles to Brownsville so they could sit in the court and hear the jury arguments in the case. And after that, we took the kids over to Padre Island and swam and played in the surf. And uh, uh, we had this one case and I've told this story, I'm sure, to both of you. But when I was in the criminal division, we caught this pimp. Big, tall, ugly guy with a birthmark on his face that had taken two women from working in a house in Galveston to working in a house in Opelousas, Louisiana, and back. Time to avoid raids by the Texas Rangers on and the uh, Louisiana police. And one of the girls, he had won in a poker game with, with her husband. And so he put her to work. He, that girl and his wife couldn't get along. She was working for him too. And so they couldn't get along, so he put her to work in a house in Beaumont. And she got to know this young man that came in and patronized the facility from the offshore rigs. His mother, his brother, happened to be a deputy sheriff in Jefferson County. And they told him about it, and he went to the FBI, and we were able to make a white slave tra traffic act case against him. And so Lee was expecting Donna, was about seven uh, months pregnant at the time. And I was going to have to be out of town with two known prostitutes as my witness, both of whom were pretty cute. Uh, and Lee was going to be at home with uh, Murph and Mary Ellen. So I thought, you know, I'm never going to hear the end of this. So I got Lee's mother and sister to look after Murph and Mary Ellen and took Lee to Galveston so she could sit in the courtroom and hear the testimony in the case. And she did that and uh, got to be a... Good story. <laughs> um, 
what about so you know I know probably the that I know about probably the hardest time of your married life would have been um, when your son passed away uh, how how did y'all kind of go beyond that and get beyond that time well He was killed in an automobile accident, and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang, and it was a police officer telling us about it. And I picked up the phone and answered it, and my first reaction is, my God, how can I tell Lee? And so I went over and she was sort of half asleep. And sweetheart, I've got something really bad I've got to tell you. And I told her about it. And I asked her, would you like to say a rosary together for me? And she said, yes, and that's what we did. We prayed the rosary. And I had gotten the police department's number and I called back and got the details of everything. And then Murph had just gone to work with Exxon Mobil and he had a part-time job house-sitting for some friends of ours. And so he wasn't in the house, he was over with uh, the Gebhardt's place. And Lisa said, call Murph and ask him to come home. She said, I want my children. And Mary Ellen was away at school and uh, uh, or, or either that or she was living up in East Texas, I forget, and Anna was at Tech, and, or rather Donna was at Tech, and I think Anna was at SMU at the time, and uh, Michael was uh, working someplace there, and we got all the kids home. And so uh, I went down and Lee's husband George went with me and made the funeral arrangements. And I'd been through that once before with my father and mother, actually twice before, and so I had some contacts and knew how to go about doing it. And so we made arrangements for a rosary at St. Cecilia's. And uh, instead of the funeral home, had made had switched it to St. Cecilia's for the announcement because they kept Hayden was one of these people everybody liked him he was always had some project on hand and so uh, and also the young man he was with what had happened we found out later was that they had left they had come back in from A&M and had gone to the St. Thomas Roundup festivities, and Lee and I were working a booth there. In fact, the last time I saw Hayden is they had a mass for the workers, and so Lee had gone to an earlier mass, and I was going over to the mass. I saw Hayden. I said, Hayden, you been to mass yet? He said, no, so let's go. So we went in and went to mass, and then he left. I went with his friends. That was the last time I saw him, and so uh, we had the funeral and the at the rosary they held it in the church at St. Cecilia's and the church was packed and uh, my law partners from the law firm all came with their families uh, all the family guild and in fact all the family guild showed up and uh turned out to be really a great occasion and then we had the funeral mass the next day and I had a situation where I was primarily concerned about Lee and the children and made a mistake is I didn't let myself grieve as I should have and wound up with a first class clinical depression about eight months later. It took me a while to get rid of. 
But the thing that Lee and I did is we prayed together a lot. We, we, all, we, we already did, but we kind of redoubled the prayer life and decided the best thing to do was get back and live our lives. You know, I got back to the law office and Lee went back to, you know, her church and other activities there. And I think all the kids were up and gone. Uh, I'm trying to think back on the, where they were all in school. And I think all of them were up in college by that time. And uh, so, you know, they kind of mesh together and you know they handle things I thought extremely well as did Lee. Yeah I always wondered if it was during high school that he had passed or if it was after high school. It was his second year in college and and Tayden had gone to A&M and actually he was out of college at that time because he had flunked out of A&M and he was waiting to get back in. And he had come back to Houston uh, and uh, he had called me and told me that he had busted out. So I said, well, you know, come on home. And remember, he told me, I said, I'll meet you down at the Metropolitan Rifle Club. We had lunch together and talked to him about it. I said, you know, this isn't the end of it, but you're going to have to buckle down. You're going to have to study and you're going to have to work. And uh, he made up his mind to do that. And so after that happened, I don't remember much about the six months afterwards. I went back to the office and I worked every day and spent all, as much time as I could with Lee and uh, our friends and the family guild. And uh, I forget what we did for a vacation that summer. We may not have taken one. But I, I really don't remember what we did that summer. I don't remember a lot of what happened after Hayden passed away. Now, um, you know, from, I've only known them a short time, but they are vastly different, the personalities of, of all those children. And, um, you know, it's all, I think what I know from just having two kids, it's kind of like managing people because it's, you know, you have all these personalities. But um, how was it with six, and, and did you have to do different approach to... Uh, six different approaches, six different people, six different individuals. Who is, who is the strongest personality out of the group? I'd say probably Murphy was. And who was, uh, who, what kid was most like you and wh which one do you think was most like Miss Lee? I think Murph was probably most like me. Uh, Mike has a lot of resemblances there. Uh, Mike now has got a good work ethic. Murph always had one. And uh, after my bad semester in pre-med, uh, I had a pretty good work ethic. Uh, or I should say bad year. And uh, one year at New Mexico, I didn't do badly, I didn't flunk anything until the second year, the second semester of my first year in Texas, that was a nosedive. And I flunked organic chemistry in German that. What, what would you consider um, throughout your life has been your greatest fear, if there was one? I mean, was it in for just about with your family or was it with work or what was your greatest fear and the, the most difficult thing to overcome? It's hard to say. When you talk about being frightened for things, when you're raising children, as you guys well know, 
you're always concerned about your kids. And later, when Lee had the problems with her mother's dementia, I got to worry about Lee on that. And she had her onset on that as she was coming home and all of a sudden her memory just went. It turned out it was more related to some mini strokes that she'd had. And it wasn't long after that that she got to the point that she was no longer able to drive her car or cook or do laundry or any of those things. And we were living in the two-story house and her balance began to be problematic. And I was scared to death she was going to fall down those steps and hurt herself. Uh, that was one of the things that I feared most was Lee. The kids, after Hayden, most of the rest of them were pretty responsible about how they acted. I mean, they weren't wild drivers. They weren't prone to do a lot of things that were dangerous. Mike had his difficulties for a long time that he finally overcame. But the thing that finally that I began to really have concerns about was when Lee had that first stroke. And of course, it just progressed on downhill until uh, the house got to be too much for us and we sold it and moved in here. And one thing I was proud of is that Mary Ellen and I were able to uh, keep her out of a nursing home and we were able to take care of her here. And she always had someone around her that was family and cared for her. And uh, in fact, one of the interesting things about it, they have a mass here every second Wednesday. And a week or so before she died, they had a mass downstairs and she was sitting in her, she was dressed and sitting in her chair in the living room and just kind of looking. And so I asked her, do you want to go to the mass? And she said, no. And the, a hospice worker who was there with us I said, Lee, why don't you do that? And so we got her up, got her in the wheelchair, and I took her down to the mass. It was the last time she was out of the apartment before she passed away. And the church was to Lee, was the most important thing in her life. Her family was important to her, but the church and God, I think, were the most important things. Your faith and her faith, did it get a lot stronger, do you think, after Hayden passed? Yes, I think so. I think so because I've known several people who lost adult or even younger children. It caused the breakup of two of the marriages. One of my appraisers in the Padre Allen National Seashore thing, one of his sons was killed in an automobile crash. And it ended to him and his wife, they just couldn't handle it. And uh, they eventually broke up. And there was one other family I knew that had, I was not, well, wasn't as close to him as I was to this guy who was my appraiser that I was working with all the time. And I knew two others families who lost children, that basically they were strong, faith-filled families, and their families survived it. But the thing about Lee and I is in addition to being in love, we really liked each other. We enjoyed being together. And I recall after the kids were up and gone, we were living out uh, in Fleetwood, Ontario, and we used to have our Saturday night at-home dates. And before Lee started having, and even after she started having some of her problems, I'd go up to Sam's and get these packages of sirloin strips. And on Saturday nights, I'd cook one on the grill, and we would microwave sweet potatoes 
and we had this salad we used to fix with. We would uh, slice an avocado on tomatoes with onions with Roquefort cheese on top of it with oil and vinegar. And we would sit and have a couple of glasses of wine, eat the steak, talk and watch old movies on television. And uh, anytime, you know, we could get together with any of the children. One of the things that was really kind of sad is once the kids got out of college, they all went different directions. Mary Ellen went up to East Texas where she and Lynn lived until they moved back to Houston. And then Murph went to work for Exxon Mobil and he actually stayed with us and then he and Jackie got married and lived in East Texas where he worked and then Louisiana and then he went overseas to uh, uh, England and then he came back to Louisiana and then he went uh, uh, back to uh, 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 went to England and then he went back to uh, uh, Kazakhstan and he went back to uh, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here, but he, he went back overseas again, and then when he retired from Exxon, he went to work for Chevron and went to Australia. And I think that's probably what happened with Murph and Jackie. They were just separated too much. It was what I had kind of foreseen when I was thinking about the military career. And uh, then uh, Donna went to first to Florida, then to California, and she was married, and unfortunately that didn't work out. Anna and John got married. They have their family in uh, St. Louis, and then Mike, his first marriage didn't work out, uh, other than producing a great grandson, a nice grandson for me, who's got a, some beautiful great-grandchildren, and uh, then he remarried, and that's worked out, and Mike is done, I think, a wonderful job, and I'm very proud of him for the substance abuse problems. One of the things with my parents, and I guess I probably should mention it, although I'm reluctant to it, is both of them at some point in their lives had problems with alcohol abuse, and they both managed to overcome it. But it ended up indirectly for me being on scholastic probation when I graduated from undergraduate school because I had to leave uh, college Christmas at the December before my end of my senior year to get them hospitalized and dried out and kind of look after family things. And I had too many cuts. And at that time at Texas and BBA school, if you weren't over your cuts unless you wanted them excused, you ended up losing a letter grade for each excess cut in each class. And I was doubling up on my courses because I changed majors. And so I ended up having one too many cuts in each one of my classes. And so I had listed parents' health problems for the reason I was out. And they said, well, what was it? And I didn't want to put on a public record that my parents had the substance abuse problem. And so the cuts were not excused. And so instead of getting uh, five Bs and a C, I got five Cs and a D, which put me below a 2.0 average for the semester. So that put me on scholastic probation for the next term but I did manage to graduate. What would you consider your biggest success in life? My family. The way that my wife and I were able to work together to raise children who became good people. Most endearing quality, I guess, was 
that she was such a good person. I mean, she had a wonderful fondness for everybody, and particularly her family. She was <coughs> well, just a, a loving, understanding person, and <coughs> uh, would do anything she could for anybody. And uh, you know, I saw it when her mother had a long illness and a long hospitalization in a nursing home and had lost her mind and usually didn't recognize Lee. And Lee and her sister would go up there, one or both of them, every day and spend time with her. And they would say the rosary together and her mother wouldn't remember things, but when they were saying the rosary, if they put a rosary in her hand, she would finger the beads. Uh, and uh, uh, Lee was, to me, I went through some difficult times professionally. Uh, after we lost Hayden about a year and a half later, the law firm I was with broke up. I had kids in college and had to start a practice all over again. And I practiced with Ben Slider, that you'll meet tonight, and later with Lee Hamill. But I went through a time where my income was less than $20,000 a year with four kids in college. And that pretty much destroyed savings and investments. And I had stayed with the United States Attorney's Office longer than I'd intended to, and I was with them for 17 years. And so consequently, I had no client base at all. And so uh, when the firm broke up, primarily because one of the partners was not turning in his timesheets and he controlled a lot of the clients, and we didn't get paid for a lot of work we did. Uh, uh, I had left the U.S. Attorney's Office because I had wanted to be a federal district judge. That was my ultimate ambition that I wanted. And one route to it was getting the U.S. Attorney's appointment and then succeeding in that and getting a judicial appointment by the president. Uh, made a run for the U.S. Attorney's job. My competitor was the head of the criminal division, Ed McDonough, I was head of the civil division. He got the job, I didn't. And he and I got along well and we sort of did our thing without, I didn't put him down, he didn't put me down, but uh, the senator wanted more criminal prosecutorial experience and Ed had that, I didn't. I mean, I really, uh, I remember when they called and told me about Ed being appointed that uh, I told the guy, I said, well, that's a good choice. It's a good man. And so Ed kept me on, and he never appointed a chief assistant. And I did that job as well as running the civil division. And uh, later, Ed would be out of town, and I'd be appointed acting United States attorney. But uh, Jimmy Carter won the election, and so Ed had to submit his resignation two and a half years after he was appointed, and I had a chance to join the firm as a partner with Lee Hamill. And uh, uh, so I took that chance and did it. And then later, 12 years later, the firm broke up and I had to start over with the kids in college. And those were some difficult times and some disappointments. But my rock of Gibraltar was Lee. I mean, she was really just you're the greatest lawyer in the world, it's so bad luck, so what? That was her attitude. And uh, I don't know, those were, you know, difficult times, but you know, it's life, you, you live through these things. And uh, later on, I had some success. Uh, we, 
I left and actually Ed McDonough had formed his own firm and I'd been practicing with Ben Slatter and we were building up a practice and Ben did a lot of probate work and probate trial work and I liked that but I was a lot better at federal criminal trial work and Ed was doing a lot of that as a former U.S. attorney he had a great deal of uh, uh, business in that area and I was getting an opportunity for that type of business but Ben didn't want to do it. He did not like criminal work. And uh, so I went with Ed's firm of counsel for a while and it brought, that firm broke up. Uh, the other shareholder, Nina Gwynn, uh, and Ed had some personality disagreements. And so if Ed had uh, allowed me to become a shareholder in that firm, I probably would have stayed with him. But he didn't, and Lee Hamill offered me a chance for an office sharing arrangement and to work together on some cases, and I did that. And then later, Lee and uh, Mike Clark and I formed a firm that had an attachment with a larger law firm that we did a lot of federal criminal work. And then Mike left for another firm, and Lee and I practiced together. And uh, Lee's wife, Carol Ann, uh, began having signs of dementia. She was 10 years younger than I am, but uh, she got to the point of where Lee would have to bring her to the office so he could keep an eye on her. And so I got to looking around and they needed a lawyer over at Lone Star Legal Aid and they hired me to go over there. And I did work for charitable cases for a year. And then they ran out of money for extra help and I went back with Lee and we practiced until Carol Ann got so bad that we finally just closed the office down and I pretty much retired and about that time Lee was having her problems and so I worked there until uh, she passed away and then uh, 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 Jackie Lucci Smith who had been a friend of Anna's at Memorial High School in the St. Cecilia's she was a judge on one of the county court benches and left to form her own firm. And so she came to Lee's funeral and asked me if I would like to do some work with their firm. And so I said, yes. So I go out and do some work and, you know, handle stuff they need to get done. And that's basically what I'm doing now. What is your most treasured possession? most treasured possession. When Lee and I got married, she had a small picture of herself in her wedding dress done and put it in a pearl lined frame that she gave me for a wedding present. I carry that with me everywhere. It always was on my desk and had it with me overseas. It was that and another picture and I guess that's my most treasured possession. Um, what piece of advice would you give any of your grandchildren or children, you know, um, about life or experiences or whatever it may be? Is there anything that? Well, I've tried to give different ones different advice based on the deed. And. I guess the one piece of advice I gave most of them is trust God and don't lose your faith. And three of them have stuck with the church, Mary Ellen and Michael and Anna. Murph is sort of semi stuck with it, although his divorce was a was a problem. Donna did not like the church, but she has a spiritual belief, not necessarily a Catholic or a Christian one, but they all have a fundamental source of values that make them good people. Uh, other advice I always gave all of them is work hard is because to accomplish anything is going to take work, it's going to take diligence. And 
if you don't accomplish anything with your life, you'll regret it. And I had an example of that. My father inherited a good bit of money from his family. All he did the rest of his life was just manage it. He was a smart, brilliant human being. But he just never could get himself started to do anything. And he expressed toward the end of his life regrets to me that uh, uh, he hadn't done more and encouraged me get the best education you can. Also my brother. I had an experience with my father that I'd like to be part of the record. As I mentioned, shortly after I was born, he left the church. He came down when he was 57 years old with lung cancer. Probably as a consequence of smoking two packages of cigarettes a day. And so I, he had had his lung removed when they did the surgery. They found out that the cancer had metastasized to the point of where there really wasn't any hope of seeing. This is 19. 57 when this was going on, 57, 58. And so uh, my brother, who was in the naval, he was a naval aviator at the time when I was back practicing law, and Lee and I had Murph and Mary Ellen, and we were living over in West U. And so uh, Pete and I went to see the doctor. It was one of those one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, we were mature enough to where the doctor would, he wouldn't talk to us like we were a couple of kids. And he just laid it on the line. And he said, you know, I can make him comfortable. I keep him alive for 90, most 120 days. But I can't save him. And it's going to spread some more, and it's going to be bad. And so we went home, and Lee was fixing dinner. And I had dinner with Lee, and Murph was in his high chair, and Mary Ellen was in her thing. And so we were sitting there, and I was really pretty hard hit. I cared very deeply for both of my parents. And so my, I was sitting there, and at that time we went to St. Vincent's Church up on Bel Air slash Holcomb Boulevard, which was down the street from where we lived in West U. So I said, honey, I'm going to go up to church for a while. And so I went up and I, they didn't, the Blessed Sacrament wasn't exposed there, but it was, of course, present as a Catholic church. And I sat there just trying to pray, and I really wasn't doing very good at it. And I'm not claiming any miracles or anything like this, but I had this feeling come over me, not a voice, nothing like that, but you need to pray for the salvation of your father's soul. Just a conviction. And I went back and told Lee about it, and we started doing that. Things progressed, and he had hospitalizations from time to time, and. Pete got some leave from the Navy and came home. And the law firm I was working for at that time was downtown, and he was at Memorial Hospital, which is on Smith Street. And so the firm told me, he said, look, you spend as much time as you want to with your father. And so I would go up there and talk to him about the business things that he did. Because somebody had, my mother had no, no business experience at all. And so we're sitting there and he turned to me and said, Bill, I said, I think all of us will feel better if I see a priest before I die. Can you make that arrangement? It's a Baptist hospital, so there are no priests on staff. 
So I went out to St. Anne's where my mother had taken my brother and I to church and where she still went to church herself. She still Presbyterian, but she'd go to a Catholic church. But I went there and talked to the pastor. He said, well, you know, your father, he's, you know, we can't be making sick calls. He's not a member of the parish. And I said, well, I grew up in the parish. And he just, well, it just, it just doesn't work that way. And I went to my parish and I got the same thing. Well, he's not a member of our parish. Your grandmother got on the phone <laughs> to the archdiocese. And her thing was to them, we have a Catholic who wants to come back to the church and he's dying in a Baptist hospital over here and we can't find a priest who'll go see him. Find somebody. You, you, you didn't know Lee, but you would have, if you knew her when she got worked up and saw her up there and this young priest shows up. He said, he said I'm father so-and-so. I'm here to see William Bowers. And I said, well, I introduced my father and I left. And so I came back, I went over to the office and I came back in about three hours and the priest was just leaving. And he st stopped me at the door and shook hands and said, he was really ready. And I walked in, my father said, well, I feel better. That's all he said about it. And he had received the sacraments, and about two days later, he lapsed into a coma and died. And I've always felt that however God chose to do it, that that was an intervention into a very important part of my life. I mean, this wasn't really responsive to your questions, but uh, it was one of those things that I'd like to be part of this record. I keep talking about it as a record like I was in the courthouse. Yeah. Um, you know, from the kids or grandkids or, you know, I'm hoping um, and, and that one day... Don't, don't cut off the great-grandkids. I uh, know. I'm, I'm thinking one day when, when Jude is, understands everything and, and maybe his great-grandkids see this and that's what we want to make this for is... Um, so they know their family history. What would you, um, what would you say you wanted to be remembered for above everything else? You know, um, what kind of legacy? Uh, I'd like to be remembered as a good husband and father and someone who loved God. But it's going to require overlooking an awful lot of faults. <laughs> All right, and Donna put this one. Who is your favorite child? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I know, under the Fifth I, Amendment of the Constitution <laughs> of the United States, I decline um, to answer. <laughs> you know, what do you, um, what, what do you, what qualities do you think? Um, each of the children uh, got from you and, and Miss Lee. You know, is there anything that stand out to you? Like, oh wow, you know, that's hard to deny. That, you know. Well, I guess the outstanding quality that they had is they are good moral human beings. Not one of them is living a bad life. Not all the lives exactly the way I might do it or might like for them to do it. But they basically have uh, sound moral foundations and they all try to live that way. They're all honest. They all work hard. They're all, what I would say, good people. And though that's the outstanding quality in all of them that I would see that got, certainly from their mother, I hope I've contributed something to it. Any final words? Pardon? Any final words, final thoughts? To... Yeah, a couple of them. Okay. Is 
Keep on hanging in there. Continue to live your lives well. You've got a massive group of people with the children, siblings, grandchildren. Uh, they're all of you. And you've made a great start to your lives. Hang in there and finish up strong. God bless all of you. And um, one thing I was thinking about what we were talking about last night, you know, you, you go into like the party this evening, for example, and you're like, you know, everyone here is, you know, because the conversations you started with Lee, uh, you know, with, with the Beowulf class, you know, this is literally a, a you know, a, just this big chain reaction, and that's kind of how everyone's lives are, and we're all connected, mm -hmm. but, you know, when you look back and you think about that, you know, how does it make you feel when you're like, you know, this is, this is everything we've created, you know? Well, it's good. I've had a blessed life. I mean, I, there, you know, I've had disappointments and stuff that I haven't accomplished I would like to. But when I look at this family, and I look at how much fun I've had practicing law and how much fun I've had doing other stuff, I mean, times with my father and mother and the times with the kids and the grandchildren and, my, uh, and with Lee. And, uh, 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 you know, I've had, I've had a great life. I, I can't complain about anything. And... Uh, you know, I'd like to my parents to have been around longer to have gotten to know my their grandchildren there. Uh, and and you know, they they were good people. They had their problems. Uh, they grew up in a life and time that's difficult. And uh, uh, you know, you get lucky sometimes. I got sent to Germany instead of Korea. I could have gotten killed over there. I could have had some stupid recruit blow up an ammunition stack when I was trying to teach them how to do things right, but they didn't. And uh, uh, some of it is diligence, some of it is the luck of the draw. What about, um, I guess, uh, one of the, the things I think about is for your children any worries that you have for any of them moving forward like you know um, things you worry about on a daily basis for them that, um, that they could work on or, or do better at or you know well okay let me put it this way I am I was worried about am worrying about am going to worry about them probably as long as I live. My law partner, Lee Hamill's son, <clears throat> became a physician. He was going to a party get-together in a driving rainstorm on Highway 6. He was in an automobile accident. And Lee dashed off to the hospital and everything, he ended up with a broken leg, and he's, he's fine now. <clears throat> but Lee came back to the office, and I was looking after some stuff there, and he sat down with me, he said, Bill, do you ever stop worrying about your children? And I said, no, you don't. But, you know, growing up when they're small, you worry about them getting sick, catching some disease that you can't do anything about. When they get older and they're in school, are they going to be in an automobile wreck on the way to school? <coughs> are they going to do something careless or stupid and injure themselves? Are they going to goof off? Are they going to later on, are they going to get involved in drug or alcohol abuse? Are they going to drive a car recklessly and have an automobile accident? Are they going to do this, that, or the other things? And most of the stuff, 99.999% of the stuff that you worry about never happens. When Hayden was killed, he was not driving the car. <coughs> and the way that happened, he and some of his buddies had been out drinking, and one of the kids had had too much to drink, and they couldn't get him to give up his keys. And so Hayden said, I'll ride with him. And the kid 
hit a mattress going onto the freeway and veered off and hit this pole and it killed both of them. Now, luck of the draw. Car stop, there's this wreck. One of the cars has a priest in it. The priest goes up and he sees the St. Thomas High School stickers and he anoints both of the boys. Hayden was probably st still barely alive at that point. At least the, par the paramedic thought he might have been. Uh, so, you know, it's a horrible thing to have happen to a member of your family. But on the other hand, what are the odds of a priest being a couple of cars back and being the kind of guy who'd get out and do something like that? I've got a great faith in God. I think God is with you all the time. And sometimes you can be a bloody damn fool and not pay attention to him. Who was the biggest influence on your life? Um, the person you looked up the most to and, and who, you know, that you aspired to be? Oh, gosh, let me think. Well, the person who had the greatest influence on my life would have been Lee. In terms of growing up, it's a toss-up between my mother and father. They had their difficulties, but they were firm disciplinarians, good teachers, and very loving parents. And there are a lot of things I got from my father and a lot of things I got from my mother. And I got a lot from my maternal grandmother. My paternal grandmother, her health was so bad and other than very early days there. But of course, the person with the greatest impact on my life was Lee. I mean, we were married for 64 years together and had a great family and just a tremendous time 